God bless you, beloved. I trust you all are doing well. It's good to see you. Good to see you all. Amen. Why don't you stand up for a moment? Why don't we um, kind of quiet in here? And let's let's uh, sing a nice hymn. Get your uh, blood uh, flowing. I love what the, um, the orchestra did today, the, the great and the, fa- the faithfulness of God. So why don't we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I'm in, on page 45. I don't know what number you're looking at in your hymnal, but pull out your hymnal. Let's sing it together. The faithfulness of God. Let's worship Him in song. together great is thy faithfulness oh god sing it out folks there is no shadow of turning with thee thou changes not thy compassions they fail not Thou forever will be great is great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning new mercies I see all that we've ever needed has provided <clears throat> to me. second verse summer summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature sure in man who follow witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great great thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies all we've ever needed that thy hand hath provided great is unto me pardon for sin and peace that endures Mm. thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for and bright hope for tomorrow blessings with ten thousand can't even count them all but he's been faithful great is oh great and morning by morning and all I ever needed thy hand provided great is Lord, 
one more time. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. Morning. I see all we've ever needed. God, I thank you. You are a faithful God, and there's no one like you, Father so consistent, unfailing, unchanging. And we bless you and praise you, Lord. We change. We're moody. We're sometime up, sometime down. But, oh God, you change not. We love you, we adore you, and we thank you for the beauty that surrounds you, the majesty of your holiness, Thank you for the glory that's manifested in your Son. Help us now to know you, I pray, to understand you, to commune with you, and to seek your face through your word. We thank you again for those that are gathered, for those who perhaps don't know you. We're asking that you would draw them by your precious spirit, draw them to a saving knowledge of Jesus. We thank you even now in the blessed name of our wonderful Savior, Jesus, we pray once again with thanksgiving. God bless you, beloved. Amen Amen indeed. Amen. Jesus is an incredible teacher. And uh, that's no surprise to you. You know that. Um, In fact, no one teaches like him. One of the things that makes his teaching so outstanding and phenomenal and so extraordinary. God bless you, dear. Good to see you. Amen. Is is, is the fact that uh, he, unlike the way we we think in in our... um, In our Western culture, we tend to think the way we've been trained to think, and not everybody thinks like this. In fact, in in Tanzania, in Africa, they don't think along the lines of um, propositions. You know, like, I I come here, I come here with a three-point outline. I've got a three-point outline for you today. Um, And that's not how they think in Africa. They, they think in, in terms, not, not of, of um, propositions and abstract thoughts and, and uh, ideas. That's the way we've been trained to think. But not, not everybody in the world is, is trained along those lines of, um, of thought. In fact, in Jesus' day and in most of Africa, they think along the lines of, of telling stories that truth from Jesus' perspective is best revealed by way of stories. Stories are interesting. They, they draw us. They, they engage us. They engage our thinking. And Jesus took full advantage of his skill in in telling stories. And one of the stories he told here is in the Luke of, I'm sorry, the Luke of, the (laughs) the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Yeah, Luke, Luke's uh, gospel here in, in chapter 12. Jesus, the master storyteller. What brought this story about 
was someone interrupting his teaching. Somebody interrupted his, his sharing. If you ever follow me, I'm, I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview in chapter 12. Follow with me here in, in chapter 12, verse 1. You'll see here in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, In the meantime, an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another. Here he was in, in uh, Luke chapter 11. He was scolding the Pharisees and the lawyers, scolding them for their hypocrisy. And while he's scolding them, chastising them, chapter 12, verse 1 says, an innumerable amount of people gathered around. So much so that they, they were trampling one another, pushing and shoving. They wanted to hear Jesus. Jesus had developed a reputation for being an extraordinary teacher. And so people followed him in, in droves, multitudes of people. And in his masterful way, he's, he's teaching. Look, look here in chapter 12, he he talks about the Pharisees and scribes to let the people know, the masses know, beware of the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and scribes. We've been talking about being authentic. We've been talking about being an authentic believer. We have been talking about being an authentic steward. So Jesus challenges the people who follow, who listen to be authentic don't follow the ways of the hypocrites, Pharisees and scribes. And here he is teaching and, and talking about the Pharisees and scribes and in their hypocrisy. And he tries to encourage the multitude. And he says to them in verse six, are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Why is he saying this? Well, because the Pharisees and scribes tended to make everybody else feel less than significant. Tended to make themselves, that is the Pharisees and the lawyers, feel superior by their riches, by their garments, by their status, by their possessions. And Jesus comforts the multitudes. God thinks about you in, in, intimately. He numbers your hairs on your head. Now, don't assume because I'm challenged in that area that God thinks of me any less than he does you. I may be follically challenged, but God still loves me. In fact, I would dare say he knows where every hair that I had where it is today. That's 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 extraordinary. God's love for us. He, he numbers the hairs. And Jesus says, also, I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, him, the son of man, will also confess before the angels of God. That we should be talking about Jesus before men. So much I, I want to say about that. That there should be this this liberty and this freedom, this intentionality about sharing Jesus Christ, talking to others about Christ. But too many of us are silent. And Jesus says, but he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. You be silent here in the earth about him. He'll be silent about you in the presence of God and the angels. And he talks about the Holy Spirit. That to speak against the Holy Spirit is to bring condemnation. Sins will never, never be forgiven. When they bring you to the synagogues and, uh, and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Jesus is giving great, great uh, information, telling them, don't worry about the Pharisees and scribes. 
You confess me before men. You talk to others about me. And don't 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 worry when they call you before tribunals and magistrates. The spirit of God will give you confidence about what you ought to say. And here he is in a deep discussion with the multitude that had gathered. About how they should relate to to these scribes and Pharisees. And then in verse 13, look at that. Then one from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I'm sure he didn't say it as calmly as I I just said. Just just think, here's a crowd of people. And when, when crowds are gathering, you know, it tends to be Murmuring, you know, you just hear buzz, buzzing and conversations, all kinds of conversations going on. And so he probably bellowed it out. Teacher, tell my brother to divide. Because, I mean, just look, look at the words. It's kind of intense. So he probably was very intense about getting Jesus's attention. In this crowd. But what amazed me. Is, is that Jesus is teaching on one subject. And this person takes Jesus to another place. And, and, and the thought came to mind, what, what came to mind is Jesus was often confronted again by crowds and, and by this, this kind of of a transition, kind of abrupt transition from one thing to the next because of what people were, were saying to him. And he, apparently he didn't mind being interrupted, but I, I think it, it, it just shows, reveals something quite important that it really does take concentration to hang with Jesus in his teaching. And that let, let me illustrate that here I am teaching and uh, during the teaching of others, when others are teaching or, or preaching or whatever. It would not surprise me that those who are listening, their minds are on something else. Amen. And it's 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 tough. For to teach. It really is. It is tough. One, um, I mean, the diversity of, of the group that we, we confront, think of all the things that are on or in our in our minds. And I'm asking you to set it all aside and to listen. Some do, some don't. And I don't feel so bad because that's that's what they did to Jesus. Some did, some don't. In fact, this man, this man was was apparently more more concerned about his own thing and less concerned about what Jesus thought was important. But Jesus didn't mind that kind of uh, distraction. And um, I, I applaud him for his his patience with people. And so I, I, I learned this. I, I want to learn this style of of being patient with with people because not everybody's going to get it the first time around not everybody's going to hear it not everybody's interested not everybody is going to agree not everybody is going to be sympathetic not everybody is going to tune in it, it, it's just it's just different we come from different places different mindsets different experiences some of us right now are are probably thinking about your, your your own pain, whether it be physical, emotional, or otherwise. So uh, people who follow Jesus were contending with a lot. People who still pursue Jesus, we contend with a lot. This man, this man, who was in the crowd, he called out to Jesus, called him rabbi, or called him teacher. Actually, the word is... Um, um, the word didaskalos, which is the idea of, of this this person who is 
giving substantive information. So he's he's giving Jesus this this uh, compliment, but not the one that he's really he's most times he's called rabbi, but here in this text he's called just a simple teacher. And he calls out to him and says to him, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. We've been talking about this idea of being an authentic believer. And last week we were looking at the idea of being an authentic steward and what that looks like in terms of our commitment to Jesus. Jesus says, if you're going to decide to follow me, that it's going to require that you deny yourself, take up your death instrument, find your death instrument, and follow me. So our cross is is an instrument of death. Our cross has nothing to do with our sickness, our pain, our suffering. The cross has everything to do with our will. He wants us to will, to choose, to sacrifice, to die to ourselves and follow him. That's that's what we looked at last week, the commitment that in order to be an authentic steward, that we're to follow Jesus fully with, with all that we are, all that we have, and be fully committed. Today we're looking at the authentic steward in light of covetousness. And I say that because that's what Jesus that's what Jesus called it. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said, but he said to him, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. This man um, is concerned about his inheritance. Apparently, his father died. And when the father dies, it is typical, it is understood, that he leaves an inheritance for his children. This is found in in the book of Deuteronomy. In fact, this idea of the inheritance. In fact, the older brother was entitled to a double portion. And the other sons were giving were given less. Now, if you if you if you just listen to the words here, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I would suggest to you that this is the younger brother appealing to who the older brother. And he's either asking one of two questions. I'm thinking you help me with this. Feel free to interrupt me. That's supposed to have been a joke, but I guess you didn't find it. Find it. It's it's one of it's one of two. It's one of two things. The the older brother, the older brother had a right to a double portion. So maybe the younger brother is saying, I want more than what's what I'm entitled to. So that's one, perhaps. Or the older brother has all of the inheritance and he hasn't given the younger brother his portion. Now, it's one of the two. But whichever one, the younger brother wants satisfaction. He's not satisfied. Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus says to him, who made me your judge? Who made me your arbitrator? And basically he says, that's not what I've come. I haven't come to get involved in family matters, to, to settle squabbles. And it is interesting how the the death of of loved ones, uh, parents, um, can create this kind of of, um, stir among the siblings. 
um, where the the idea of the inheritance, um, we who's going to get the most, or who's going to well, who's going to get what, um, and so sometimes the reading of the will becomes a a, a very intense moment when when it's discovered that one gets the house and the other gets the car and uh, it's these these family uh, situations can be quite uh, divisive when when the uh, mother or father dies but Jesus says I, I'm not I'm not going to work that's not my that's not my responsibility to su- to settle family family uh, matters but what he did, he took the opportunity uh, as a teachable moment. He, this man interrupted Jesus and took him off, off point and took him to another subject. And Jesus took the opportunity. OK. You really want to go there? This 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 is this, G- Jesus is saying, look, take heed. And beware of covetousness. So right away he calls the man out. In fact, he calls both of them out. Look at the text. Look at this. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them. I think he's talking to both of these, both of these uh, men. But here the crowd has gathered. And what is he going to say to them? He talks about covetousness. Covetousness is, and um, in fact, in the Old Testament, we're it's part of the Ten Commandments that we should not covet. Covetousness is this idea of inordinate longing, desire, for what actually belongs to someone else. And so for Jesus to say this, he's basically rebuking, rebuking these men for their covetousness. Um, And how does he do it? He tells a story. (laughs) He tells a story. Tells them to take heed. And and the, the word there is is, is I mean, in its regular form, take heed, it's the word for watching or eyes. Be be careful of what you see. Horao, take heed. In in other words, in other words, the way it's being used, watch how you look <laughs> at things and life. Take heed. It's a warning. And he says, beware. So he heightens our sense of of, uh, caution. This is not something we want to take for granted. Jesus says, take heed and beware. You and I need to be have a a heightened sense of. Of awareness. And what of covetousness. Covetousness, again, is this inordinate desire to have, to possess for oneself. And the whole idea here, he reveals it in a story. He spoke a parable to them. This idea of parable um, is, is this word where he's throwing a story. He throws it alongside that's what parable means, to cast alongside the story. He casts alongside what's going on, and he tells the story of what? The ground of a certain rich man yielding plentifully. Right away, I'm sure he caught their, their ears because he's talking about rich people. And if you want to catch the ear of, of poor people, what? Talk about rich people. The ground of a certain rich man. The the rich are in contrast to the poor in Scripture. Old Testament 
and New Testament. Not that God doesn't have some rich people, but they're in contrast. The idea of being rich and being poor, they're, they're, they're in, in opposite ideas. In fact, in Psalm 37, 16, it, it says a little that a righteous man has. Think about this. The little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. That, see, see the contrast? So the little that poor people have is better than the riches of the wicked. But poor don't think like that. That's why so many play, play the lottery. Bet on horses. Just opened up uh, two new casinos, Arundel Mills and one down on uh, Russell Street. And, 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 you, and you know who's going in there? It's not the rich. The rich aren't going to throw their money away in casinos. I mean, I know. I mean, generally speaking, I know some rich perhaps do. But but most of the money that casinos are making are not coming from rich people. It's coming from poor people who what? Want to be rich. And what would we call that? That's covetous. Proverbs 15, 16 says, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. And some might say, you know what, I, I don't mind trying it out. <laughs> but, but the word says better, it is better to fear God with your little. See, last, last week we were talking about thinking like God. To, to be to be what to be this this authentic steward we need to think like him rather than thinking like men see this is how men men think about riches proverbs 28 6 says better is the poor you know men don't think like that men don't think poor people are better off scripture says God says better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one perverse in his ways, even though he be rich. And it's amazing, it's amazing. Look, look at the, the, the people that we applaud. The celebrities, the stars, the, the, uh, the athletes. And a lot of them are perverse and they're just wicked. And they're rich. But yet, but yet they're, they're worshipped. First Timothy chapter six, verse six says that we brought nothing into this world and it is certain that we will carry nothing out. That that true gain is godliness. Godliness is true gain, Paul says. But that's that's not how poor people think. And, and I, I would suggest to you that this, this man here is, is covetous. In fact, both of them, I would say to you, are, are perhaps covetous. The poor are covetous because they want what the rich have. The rich are covetous because they have it and don't want to give it often. And they want to keep it. That's that's what we're going to see. Look at this. Look at this. The ground of a certain rich man. A rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all of my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, 
you're a fool. This night, your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? The covetous. The covetous are careless. They can, they can be very careless in terms of other people, as illustrated in this rich man. The rich man made his riches um, in one way or another. Really, the, the text doesn't say it, but here he is as a rich man, and he probably has people working for him. If, if, he, if his land yielded plentifully, he probably has people working for him. And if that's the case, then let, let's just think that maybe he believes in, in what's called capitalism. You know, capitalism is what um, our Western culture is, is based upon. And capitalism basically is the idea, what it does, it fosters independent living and uh, the freedom to, to do uh, what you want, to, be, to initiate, um, to start on your own and to take care of yourself th- without being dependent on other people. Capitalism. But there, there's a downside to capitalism because capitalism creates greed. It creates a sense of selfishness. It creates a sense of, of uh, insensitivity to other people. This rich man, listen to his words again. He's careless in his thinking. He says... In his own mind, he thought within himself. And that's his first problem. In terms of covetousness, in terms of being a authentic steward of God. To think within ourselves and what he's doing, clearly he's thinking for himself, about himself. And in himself. He's obsessed with himself. That's his first mistake. Covetousness creates this kind of selfish, independent thinking about self. And he says, what shall I do since I have no room to store? This, 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 uh, this poor man, this rich man, is truly a poor man. And we're going to see that later in the text, but here he's so obsessed with himself. Do you know, if, if you were to count the pronouns, the personal pronouns, 13 times he speaks to himself about himself. Look, look, let's, let's count them. Let's count them. What shall... I do since I have no room to store my crops. So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my bonds and build greater. And there I will store all of my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Thirteen times. He's obsessed with himself. His contemplation is, is of himself. He's consumed with himself. And, and, um, to be a faithful steward of God, to think like God, is really challenging, particularly for us in this country and in this culture that we're in, because it breeds, it breeds selfishness. It doesn't breed the idea of others. It, I mean, this could be us. I, I, me, talking to myself, you, 
you. It, it, it could be us. There's an obsession in us. I, I was, um, those of you who perhaps have your smartphones, pull them out. And I, I was checking this out. The average cost of living in, in the United States, the average cost. Now, when I say that, I, I mean in terms of food, just, just on living on food, just food alone, on a, a daily basis, what it takes to feed us. And on a daily basis, the average amount of food, average amount of food that we spend, uh, money that we spend on ourselves, to feed ourselves on an average. Now, I'm not saying every day. I'm not saying everybody. I'm just saying average on a national basis. On average, we spend anywhere from 20 to $25 per day just in terms of food. The world has about 7 billion people. In fact, it's over 7 billion people. It's heading toward 8 billion. And of the 7 billion people, 3 to 4 billion live on less than $2.50 a day. Eighty percent of the seven billion live on less than. Now, this is somewhere between five and six billion people live on less than ten dollars a day. But almost half live on less than two dollars and fifty cents a day. And, and I would suggest to you, beloved, that based on those statistics, we are not poor in this country. We are the rich. We, we are the rich ones. God indeed has blessed this country marvelously. But what, what he does when he blesses rich people, and we're going to see it in, in throughout scripture, this, this idea of the, how um, the rich think um, don't primarily think of themselves. There is this contrast between poor and the rich. That there is this in terms of how they think, and and the the rich tend to think of of themselves. In um, Tanzania, we um, went into one village um, among the Vadunda people, and we came up the hill there, and they they had about. Um, I don't know, somewhere around 200 kids that were outside in class. And we just kept walking through the village and we came to this building and it had no windows. I mean, there were openings in the, in the mud brick um, building and the thatch roof. There were openings like a door and there, what we would call windows, but there was no glass, obviously, no glass there. And the climate there, yeah, this is their winter. So it was probably about, uh, most times it was around 80 degrees. It was their winter. So it was a lot cooler. It wasn't the, the hot, the hot, the 100 degree and above that Tanzania is known for. So here these, uh, these uh, dear women were in this building and there was a fire going. And there's a little pot, and they were making a community, a community meal. And you would see them sort of stooping down around it. In fact, some of them would just bend over at the back and just stir in the pot. And, and as we approached, our translator began talking with them, greeting them, and they came out, and they, they were smiling they, they were just so elated that people from um, America came to visit. And, and uh, they were also elated to see um, people of color uh, visiting them. In, in fact, they were shocked 
that I, uh, African American, a black man, needed a translator. They assumed that I spoke Swahili because of the color of my skin, and they looked puzzled. <laughs> and then they started laughing because I'm trying to speak Swahili, and they just had a, they were just laughing. But I, I was amazed. I was just amazed, taken back by, by what appeared to be a sense of contentment with so little, so little. God just opened my eyes to see that, that I, I'm not so sure we really need all that we have. I think I think we've learned to live like this. I, I think we've been conditioned in our thinking to live at this level. And I think I think unfortunately, many of us as believers, yea, even believers in, in Christ, are infected. With covetousness. Let, let me let me illustrate. You know, you know what? Um, this week I had a horrible week. This week on my my computer. See what what am I illustrating? They they in Tanzania they don't know what, even what a computer is. And I I've, I've so conditioned my life now. I need a computer. <laughs> I need the smartphone. Do you know what it feels like when you leave your smartphone at home? Man, just bugs me out. What, what is that's conditioning? That's conditioning. This week, um, um, I, I was trying to go to the internet. And couldn't get it. And my wife said, well, I've got it. <laughs> I'm, try- I'm frustrated now. I, I can't. And-, and I need the Internet because I'm, I'm doing some classwork. I'm in school again, and I'm trying to study. In fact, one of my classes is, is uh, statistic. God, help me. Please pray for me. Amen, Amen. Amen. please. And I mean that. At my age, at my age. And, and I'm sitting in class with, with the, the teacher. I probably could be her dad. And all the students could be my grandchildren. And I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, the shikamal. <laughs> Among the, the, the maharaba. And, and uh, one of the things required was I, I needed this, this uh, software in order to, to do my homework. And so I loaded it on and went out, got it, and, and did it. But days later, now I can't use my internet. And I'm puzzled. I finally got um, uh, Microsoft. Uh, no, I'm sorry, forgive me. Toshiba. Because it's a Toshiba uh, laptop support, and and, and they uh, they said to me, um, Mr. Gaines, would you mind? Now here I'm. He said, Where are you? I said, I'm in Maryland. I said, Well, where are you? He says, Well, I'm in out here in Minnesota. <laughs> and right away I'm getting frustrated. Yeah. Well, how are you going to help me? You <laughs> know. He says, Mr. Gaines, do I have permission? Would you give me permission to remotely control your laptop? I said, what? He says, yeah, I, I, I want to control your laptop from here in Minnesota. I said, dude, you can do that? <laughs> yeah. He says, you type, you type this code in. You go where I tell you to go. Type this code in. And I will, I will remotely control your, your laptop. Sure enough, he did that. 
And, and um, while, while he's doing that, he says, Mr. Gaines, what are all these programs you've downloaded? I said, I'm in school. I need, he says, oh, so you went out on the internet and pulled these in? He says, don't you know that every time you go out on the internet, you're bringing viruses back with you? Every time. He says, and you're, and you're, um, you're um, a Kaspersky is not the full family to protect. You, you, you're not protected. You only have a trial version of virus protection. And he says, you're, you're, you're exposed. And he says, all these, this software that you, he says, when, you, when you're going out, when you have to do that, you go through Microsoft or go through the uh, Toshiba. Um, but, but don't, don't buy on your own. Otherwise, you get these viruses and malwares. They attach to the software. They come back, and they, they ruin your, your work. And, and so I, I just thought to myself, I thought to myself, and, and I heard God talking to me. You, you know what he wants? As, as, as um, authentic stewards, you know what he wants of us? He wants to remotely tap into our lives and, and control our, the screen of our lives. But, but you know... M- Many of us, I, I think, I think many of us have a virus. <laughs> I think because we're, we're so tapped into this culture, yeah. Yeah. We, we've got the virus, we've got yeah. the malware, yeah. we, we think like them. And we're conditioned, we're conditioned to think, and we think this is good. We, we think we need Smartphones, laptops, we think we need to spend all of this on ourselves. And then, you know what we do? We call ourselves poor. <laughs> really? You, I, I, I want to say to you, beloved, if you get the chance to go to Tanzania and prayerfully Many of you will get that opportunity, the Lord willing, if, if things go according to the way we're praying. And, and when you get outside the country, when you get outside or you go to Cuba, you go to other third world. They call them third world for a reason. Because they're facing conditions that are nowhere near. We don't we don't. I mean, going going sanitation, it, it, it's incredible. No running water in Tanzania, in, in most buildings and where people live. Those that do have um, bathrooms in the house, it's just a hole in the ground. Flush? Flush what? People are content to live in one room. When, when we went to the Kutu uh, people, um, the chief, when, when you engage with any village, any group of people, you have to talk to the chief. You just don't walk in. See, in the West, you know, we're just so arrogant. We think we can go anywhere we want and talk. It, it's no. It, and, oh, God knows. I, I needed to learn humility. So you, you, you just don't walk up to people, uh, young kids in, in these cultures or, or, or women and, and speak. And, and you may not mean anything, but the culture, they've been conditioned one way. But here in the West, we've been conditioned another way. And, and what we learn to, to, to um, respect, uh, again, um, their culture rather than offend them. But the, the chief said, the chief said, here we are sharing stories about Yesu, Yesu. And at the end of the, the story, um, these 15 men, as I shared with you, as I shared with you, these 15 men, all of them, all of them, 
wanted us to stay. They wanted to hear more about Yesu, stories about Jesus. And, and the uh, chief asked, please, this is what he said, please come back and tell more stories. I, I was just blown away, blown away. He said to us, he says, we don't need another building. Catholic churches down the road and other villages built a, a buildings and, and nothing is happening. He says, we don't want buildings. We don't want that. He said, what we want, what we need, we need to hear more stories like we need, we need. He says, we need, we need water, just basic water. In order to get water, they've got to go and, and carry it in, in yellow, yellow containers up a hill. I saw, I saw an elderly lady. I saw an elderly lady. Now it took us. It was about five. I, I think the mountain maybe is maybe as high as eight to nine miles. But we went up maybe about five to six miles, and we rode up on motorcycles up this this ridiculously rough road with caverns of of gullies created by heavy rains. It was it was just hard and rough. We, we got up to the top and and um, we, we noticed as we're going that this elderly woman was carrying on her back water and, and substance, I, I believe some vegetables in her hand that she had bought down at the base of the hill. Just blown away by the, the kind of conditioning that's in, in the poor. They learn, they learn, they learn to be thankful. And maybe, maybe not necessarily at this point thankful to the God we know, but somehow or another they're they're content. And they share what little they have, which is incredible, just incredible. This rich man thought about himself. And I'm afraid that we, um, as um, stewards of God, we, we've forgotten that who we are and what we have, it really doesn't belong to us and, and when we think, we're, we're, no, we're no different, we're no different than this rich man. My bank account, my food, my clothes, my house, my car. How is that any different than this rich man? See, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is, I, I think if, if we're going to be authentic stewards, it's going to require us to... Again, remotely be controlled by what God wants to do. What does he want to do? I, want, I think he wants to deprogram us. That, that's what the Spirit of God is trying to do. The Spirit of God wants to deprogram us so that we stop thinking like men and start thinking like God. God thinks about others. That's why Jesus came, because he thinks about others. And, and so he wants, he wants us to uh, be deprogrammed, to be thinking like, like God. This, this rich man um, said, I want to build bigger bonds for my increase. Now, you would think that that's, that's a smart thing to do. I would ask him, well, what about giving it away? Now, already you've got one barn that's full. Right? That's why he's building another barn, because he already has one that's full. So if you got one that's full, why not give everything else away? All right. If, if you want to make a profit, fine, make a profit. But somehow or another, sell it or give it away to the poor. But but no, no. What did he want to do? He just wanted to what? Keep it for himself. Another thing I found uh, this week that uh, the, um, the storage industry, 
is, is booming. Where, where people buy space to store their goods. Some people are in transition. Oh, moving from this place to this place, so I don't have any place, or, but I'm looking for a place, so I'm going to store it maybe for a, a, a month or so. But then um, at the, the article that I was reading suggested that most people have more stuff than they need, don't know what to do with it, and they, they put it in storage. Some have, their, their stuff has been in there for years. And they're paying money. What, what is that? What is that? I, I think the increase of, of the storage industry is an indication that we're covetous. We're no different than this rich man. Built bonds to house his excess. And, and a lot of folk, a lot of folk are doing the same thing with, with their property. What's what's what, what what am I getting at? I'm getting at this that the the covetous, the covetous man, he contemplated things that that he, he's a consumer. And you know what? That that's what capitalism does. It creates consumers. All we want to do is consume. We want to buy. And you know what? Um, the, the iPhone 5 came out, and, and next year it's going to be the what? And, and after that, it's the what? It, it, it just doesn't stop. Because if it stops, then capitalism <laughs> stops. But, but you know what? You and I need to start thinking like God. And, and one way we can start thinking like God, I, I think rather than rather than storing stuff, I think we need to start giving stuff away. I think we need to start learning to live with less. I really do. And, and you know what? You know what? Thanks be to God. When, when we get when we get our bridges 501c3 up and running, you know what we're going to do? We're, we're going to have some uh, a yard sale for bridges. See, Bridges is going to be the nonprofit so that we can reach this community. But we're going to ask you to bring everything that that take it out of your storage bins. Go, go, go empty it. And let's let's bring it here. Let's let's give it away. Let's give it away. Let's let's. And, and we're going to do this for what? We're going to do this for Bridges. Well, we can do that now, actually, with the community outreach. We need we need to learn to start uh, start living on less with less so that um, here in fact here in the uh, the story um, this 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 rich man is talking to himself and then God starts talking to him look at this verse 20 but God said to him fool see most most rich people we would assume are what smart Smart. And 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 they, they they're smart in terms of what? Being money wise, but they're foolish in terms of eternal matters. Look at look at what God said. God said to him, You're a fool. And the, and the word he used, there are a couple of words in, in the New Testament for fool. One of them is the word moron. So where we get our word moron. Moron is just an idiot. Somebody who's got sense, but just acts like he's a nut. But then, then there's another word, aphron. This, this word, it, to, to friend, to have a friend means to have a mind, but to put an A in front of it, uh, alpha privative is called, it, it negates the mind. No mind. No mind. <laughs> what? You don't understand. See, the rich man really didn't understand reality. God gave him a reality check. And God knows we need it. We need a reality check. Because he says, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And and in, in the text, you don't see it. But it's, it's in the original. This night your soul will be required. The word required is in the plural. 
Think about that. Now, this is God saying to the man, your soul, singular, will be required, plural. Who's God referring to? God's referring to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are going, to, are going to require, he will stand before God and give an answer, and give an answer for his folly. Why? What's his folly? Look at the text. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and not rich toward God. The, the, um, the question God asked him, when you die, whose, will, whose stuff, who will that be? I mean, the stuff you have, who will that belong to? And that, see, that, that's the, the fear of many. In fact, if you read in Proverbs, um, a, lot of, a lot of rich people, they, they lay awake wondering, who's going to stay? Who's going to take my stuff? It's about making more. And, and, and Jesus says here, uh, God will say, Whose will those things be? He, he works. E- Ecclesiastes talks about the man who labors all of his life. And then and then later when he dies. A fool comes along and wastes it. He spent his life building his business and his son just ruins it. That's that's God is sort of taunting him. So is he who lays up treasure for himself. And and beloved, um, we're challenged. We're challenged by God to be um, authentic stewards. And to be doing what? As we go on in in this section, we're going to discover that to be an authentic steward means rather than laying up treasure in the earth, we should be what? Laying up treasure where? In fact, he says here, toward God. He's not rich toward God. What is what is this idea of being rich toward God? To to be rich toward God. Oh, or let 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 me do it in the negative sense. To be um, poor toward God is is clearly to not. Think this poor man. Did he think about God? No, no, he didn't even consider. James says he he said James says that that foolish people and arrogant people, they say tomorrow I'm going here and I'm going to make some money. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And and James says that. what, What are you doing? You're being presumptuous. What you ought to say is what? God willing, the Lord willing. Well, this this fool, he wasn't thinking in terms of God. He he had no concept of dependency upon God. And and so he's not rich toward God. What does this look like? To be rich toward God means um, I I think I I really believe in the um, the uh, intimate pursuit of God and that you and I can't intimately pursue God without without his word. And and I I don't know, but I I think part of being rich toward God should be reflected in how we're so obsessed rather than with ourselves, be obsessed with what God has said. One way of showing that obsession is by memorizing scripture. It seems kind of simplistic. Well, I just can't. I just, I just, I just, and you know what? It's no more than this rich man. Stop thinking about yourself. Start hiding just what scripture says. What? See, we, we condition ourselves to think what we, we don't want to pursue God. We don't want to sacrifice. We don't want to cause any pain to ourselves. And, and you know what? To think like God is to deny self. But to think like men is to pamper ourselves. See, that's what the rich man did. He says, I, 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 I. Let me close. I challenged you a, um, a couple of weeks ago to take the track 
and to share with someone. And I, I want to keep challenging you. We have a bunch of tracks, and I trust you, you're doing that. Because you know what? You know what doing this does? It, it takes your mind off of you. It does. Think about this. You and I have 24 hours, and how much of that is spent thinking about me? What I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear, where I'm going to go. You know what? Sharing Jesus Christ with someone takes your mind. Pray and say, Lord, I want three people this week. God answers prayer. He answers prayer. He will do it. He will give you three people or more that, that you can share the gospel with, that you can share this track with. And it, it has an amazing effect. Um, and what, what you're doing is building treasure toward God. And, and I close with this. I close with this. One of our um, precious uh, members here at Manor Mano Bible is, is rich toward God. And I'm not saying others aren't, but I just want to illustrate what that looks like. Just an example. I'm not asking you to do the same. I just want you to know what being rich looks like. One illustration of being rich toward God. Someone who's investing not in this world, but is investing in the next world. Is investing in eternity. And this, this, pre, this precious uh, member, uh, precious daughter of God, um, gave to me um, um, a, a form and, and said to me, Pastor, this is for Manna Bible. That when I die, I want Manna Bible to have half of my retirement. What is that? She's rich. Amen. She's rich toward God. And, and you know what she's doing? She's investing in eternity. And, and Lord willing, you, you know what? The rapture will come. But if, 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 the, if, if not, it is possible that when we make those kinds of investments, that we can be in heaven. And we can still be remotely investing in eternity. In fact, the scripture says of Moses, though he be dead, yet he what? Still speaks. See, we can be in the presence of God and still dividends are making their way into the presence of Jesus Christ. I, th I thank God for that kind of thinking. She is, she is indeed an authentic steward.